Um, it is 12.05 and we should get this meeting um, started. Um, there will be more people joining gradually. Um, and, but in the meantime, um, so welcome everybody. My name is Paul Lachelier. I'm the chair of the Citizen Diplomacy Research Group, which is a, a new group within the Public Diplomacy Council. Uh, the Public Diplomacy Council um, advocates um, for better understanding and the promotion of uh, public diplomacy. Um, and, um, and so uh, you're welcome, of course, to join um, the Public Diplomacy Council uh, if you look it up online. I don't have a, uh, Debbie, if you happen to have a, um, a link to the Public Diplomacy Council, people can um, check out, that would be awesome. Um, okay. So, um, so I'm going to announce a couple of things uh, before we move right into our um, uh, our presentations for today, and uh, and then I'll quickly go over the agenda, which um, Debbie is kindly posting to the chat. Um, so, um, for one, um, hold on a second here. Uh, I want to note that. Um, we have um, uh, the um, CDRG uh, Facebook group is coming soon um, and we'll likely also create a LinkedIn group. Um, so you'll get notice of that via the email list. Um, if for some reason you're not already on the email list, um, you should post to the chat your email address, um, your name, your title and your organization, and we'll add you to the, uh, to the email list so that you get invitations um, to our group meetings and other, uh, and other content. Um, so I'm gonna review the agenda <clears throat> um, for today <clears throat> to make things clear. Uh, first, we, so besides these introductions, what I'd like, it would be great for you all to, while I'm, I'm going through the agenda, um, to introduce yourselves. But um, rather than what we did last time, which took, which took half the time, which was good because it was our first time meeting, uh, but took half, half of our meeting devoted to introductions, uh, this time around, we um, are simply encouraging each of you to post uh, a one paragraph bio or um, uh, some sort of link to your LinkedIn profile, your website, um, or else that would introduce you. So feel free to do that now while I go over the agenda. So once um, the, um, everybody's introduced themselves um, and I'm done going through this review, we'll go right into two presentations. So the aim for upcoming meetings is um, to have two presentations per meeting. They will be short, um, 12 minutes a piece. Um, and in this case, we're having Robert Kelly uh, and um, Haley Pottle um, uh, present each for 12 minutes. Uh, Robert will be presenting on definitions, landscape, and trends in citizen diplomacy worldwide. Um, and Haley will be presenting on a specific program called Tech Girls, uh, sponsored by the um, US State Department. Um, then we'll go into questions um, and, uh, and discussion. And here, I think it's best um, if you each and I'll remind you of this when we get to that, but if you each post that you would like to ask a question or make a comment, uh, it'll make it easier for me to basically have the order of people. Um, so post that in the chat that you would like to ask a question or make a comment. Um, we'll have 20 minutes for questions and discussion based on the presentations. Um, and then we will move um, to announcements. Um, and in announcements, um, uh, we will, um, uh, we will have, um, that will be essentially time for each of you. Uh, we'll limit you to one minute, but um, each of you will have the time to, um, uh, to, um, to present programs, projects, um, events, um, publications, et cetera, and so forth. And you'll of course be free to uh, post as well some details about whatever you're promoting or whatever you'd like to, um, people to know about um, in the chat. Um, we're encouraging a lot of um, posting on, ch on the chat because that's a way for us to share um, more easily uh, the details of um, this meeting to those who cannot make the meeting. Um, and it is a broader group. Currently we have about 
I think it's uh, 187 people on our wider list. Um, so the group is growing. The last thing which is not listed here, uh, but I will reserve about 10 minutes at the end um, to hear from you for those um, who are, would like to present um, at an upcoming meeting. It's very important though that the presentation has to be about citizen diplomacy in some manner. So about uh, interchange, people to people exchange across nations. Um, so uh, we'll have 10 minutes at the end to talk about who would like um, to present. There's no guarantee we'll be able to accommodate everybody um, for upcoming presentations, uh, but we're shooting, as I mentioned, for two presentations per meeting, and the next meeting is in October. Uh, all right, with that said, um, I am gonna introduce our two, uh, our two speakers, one, well, actually, um, our two speak, I'll, I'll introduce um, uh, them one at a time. Um, Rob um, Kelly uh, is coming to us from American University, um, and he is, um, is an assistant professor at the School of International Service at American University. His interests lie at the intersection of culture and politics, and he specializes in the study of global citizenship, or the exercise of civic responsibility on a global level. Uh, Professor Kelly explores global citizenship in the diplomatic arena and is regarded as a leading figure in new diplomacy studies that re recognize the citizen as a legitimate global actor. The subject of his latest book, Agency Change, Diplomatic Action Beyond the State, which was published in 2014. He completed studies on the state of U.S. public diplomacy since 9-11 earning the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in International Relations at the London School of Economics. He subsequently developed this research while a Hayward um, Alker postdoctoral fellow at the USC Center for International Studies. Notable publications include the article U.S. Public Diplomacy, a Cold War Success Story, with a question mark by that, in the Hague Journal of Diplomacy, as well as Between Takeoffs and Crash Landings, Situational Aspects of Public Diplomacy in the Public Diplomacy Handbook, edited by Nancy Snow and Philip Taylor. Um, another article is The New Diplomacy Evolution of Revolution of a Revolution in Diplomacy and Statecraft and Advisor Non Grata, The Dueling Roles of U.S. Public Diplomacy in Trials of Engagement, The Future of U.S. Public Diplomacy, <clears throat> edited by Ali Fisher and Scott Lucas. Kelly directed the International Management Institute at the American University, setting a new course for the training and consulting of diplomatic corps of the diplomatic corps around the world. Prior to entering academia, he worked at the U.S. Department of State, and before that, logged several years and thousands of frequent flyer miles in the world of international business consulting. Um, so, Rob, um, take it away. Um, I assume you should be able to, to share your screen. Yes, yes, so I'll get to that. Great. Um, right. And I'll put up your, um, your bio while, while you're doing that. I've, I've done the same. Um, oh, you did, okay, great. Yeah, so everybody should see a slideshow, um, a kind of you know, tile looking thing with my title and uh, all that, so that looks good. Um, thank you, Paul, for that introduction, and um, great to see you. Can you speak a little closer to your mic? Oh, sure. How's that? Much better. <laughs> I'll have it in my face, a boom mic. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, it's great to see everybody's faces, and um, I'll do my best here to just give you the lay of the land with cultural diplomacy, um, as you've heard, is something that I, I do research on. I'm very much interested in intersections between um, the traditional politics of diplomacy, the kind of new developing versions of diplomacies out there, um, intersections between state and non-state actors. So um, uh, you'll see that my presentation, if you know anything about my research, about how I come at this, um, I take to heart what um, what Sean Reardon, the British um, scholar, said many years ago in the new public diplomacy 
uh, um, edited volume by Jan Mellison um, drawing a distinction between diplomacy by publics and diplomacy of publics. And I'm very much interested in, um, in diplomacy by publics and how that fits within um, more uh, conventional uh, official versions of the diplomacy um, construct. So um, I'll start off with a story here. Stories are always, um, you know, a, uh, a good way to jump into these things if you can see all right. Um, just tracing back to 1983, this is the subject of my current research. I'm looking at citizen diplom a citizen diplomacy case dating back to um, the time when the United States and the Soviet Union were uh, experiencing a spike in tensions over specifically uh, the proliferation of intermediate nuclear forces in Western Europe, West Germany specifically, and um, threats back and forth between the Soviet Union and the United States of, um, of expanding their, their, their arsenals, the Soviets, their SS-20s, and the Americans, their Pershing twos. Um, that's a picture of a Pershing II launching on the right. Um, but, um, of course, in the mix of all this, there was the public in which these forces would be placed. And, and, and so on the left side, you see a picture of West Germans marching um, throughout the summer, of 19, the summer and fall of 1983. Um, tensions had also been um, inflamed by the famous Evil Empire speech, um, you know, which um, really punctuated the way that the new Reagan administration was handling the Soviet Union. Um, and in return, I think what you find in the Soviet Union is a lot of um, uh, insecurity at the top. Um, Brezhnev dies in the fall of 1982. Uh, Yuri Andropov, a long veteran of the KGB, takes over after a power struggle with what would be, who would be his successor, Konstantin Chernenko, in 1984. Um, and, uh, and so Brezhnev's, I'm sorry, Brezhnev's death heralding the arrival of Andropov um, is, is just exacerbating the degree to which the Soviet Union is really experiencing a lot of insecurity and feeling it and also recognizing their limitations, just not being able to keep up with the United States. Um, an article in Time magazine putting Andropov on the cover comes out in November of 1982. And when this article comes out, this cover comes out, it is noticed by a 10-year-old girl. This girl is from uh, central Maine, and she tells her mother that she's interested in writing a letter to him because she's very concerned about what the Soviet Union is going to do with their nuclear weapons. And that's the letter on the left. Um, the letter somehow makes its way to Yuri Andropov, to whom this letter is addressed. And um, curiously and improbably, Yuri Andropov reads the letter. It's published in Pravda. And about five or six months later after the letter is sent, at which point Samantha Smith has forgotten sending this letter, um, this uh, Andropov uh, responds. And um, this is a, a portion of his response below. And in the response, invites Samantha Smith to come to the Soviet Union. Uh, which she does with her parents in the summer of 1983 while all this is going on in Western Europe. Now, aside from the fact that this is a really feel-good story, there's an instrumental purpose to all this, and that is the Soviet Union is really trying to convey to Western Europe in particular that the world need not be afraid of the Soviet Union in this instance, that it's really about the United States and their aggression in Western Europe that is causing all of this tension. And so... Um, there's a political purpose behind this. But meanwhile, what happens is Samantha Smith goes to the Soviet Union and it is a huge success, not for the reasons that the Soviet Union had planned. Um, what ends up happening is that the Soviet Union discovers that this American girl representing all Americans in their eyes is approachable, is telegenic, charismatic, polite, interested in them. And this causes, to some degree, a lot of uh, introspection in the Soviet Union that maybe Americans weren't as bad as they'd been made out to be for decades and decades. And, um, and the lasting impact of this is really notable. And part of the research that I'm doing is why 
Samantha Smith's impact had such large reverberations in the Soviet Union um, and relatively less in the United States, um, where she is all but forgotten. Incidentally, today is the 35th anniversary of her death. She died in a plane crash in August 1985. So um, this was a, a huge success and an example of how cultural diplomacy can be um, a force for um, a political gain, but also to speak directly to publics um, when um, messages from the official level aren't penetrating. And I'll refer back to a quote, um, a definition from Nick Cull's book last year, um, defining cultural diplomacy as an actor's engagement of a foreign public through intervention in the cultural field. And in Samantha Smith's example, it wasn't just the trip to the Soviet Union, it was a red carpet welcoming to all of the best um, cultural institutions that the Soviet Union could present. Ballet, um, the most prestigious summer camp in the Ukraine, um, St. Petersburg, um, Petrograd, so on and so forth, all of the top things that you can think of, including um, a, an almost unprecedented visit um, inside the Kremlin and um, a special VIP visit to Lenin's tomb. So this was um, um, cultural in its show, um, but all for a specific purpose, and the Smith family was, was happy to go along with it in the spirit of international peace. So the two sides of this um, cultural diplomacy um, that I want to raise are um, the acquisition and expression of soft power. And this is why public diploma, I'm sorry, cultural diplomacy is employed within the, uh, the broader range of you know, the, the diplomatic tools, but um, also to enhance and manage a, na a nation brand. So here's your operational definition. Um, one thing that I want to raise that's very important about cultural diplomacy in contrast to other types of public diplomacy is um, when you look at something like information and influence, these three discrete categories of information, influence, engagement that um, have existed for some time now, uh, that with information and influence, it's designed to shape the information environment in a detectable way with some sort of immediate outcome in return. And with cultural diplomacy, this is a longer term effort, investing in the building of relationships. Now, what we'll see in the examples is that this building of relationship too can also attend to different political purposes or no political purpose at all. It's really just about mutual understanding. And this brings into the picture the, the tension between um, two directions of, um, of communication that have so defined public diplomacy as of late. Do we invest in the kind of um, communication and relationship building which is my one-way messaging or is it going to be a reciprocated two-way messaging relationship where I am speaking as well as listening? And, and so this is where the trend is going, or this is one of the trends that I think we've seen over time with cultural diplomacy, is that they began as extensions of empire um, in their modern form, I'll say. And um, we see an old uh, photo of the British Council um, and Alliance Francaise, which dates back even further than the British Council. Um, and then the post-war creation of the Goethe Institute with the Germans, which I think represents a more two-way, softer version of soft power, trying to, again, prep the world for a kinder, gentler version of Germany. Um, and so Rob, here, just so you know, you've got about three minutes. I'm sorry, thank you very much. So this is the, um, I'd say the, the first um, modern iteration of cultural diplomacy, getting us um, extensions of empire, lots of one way, but generally moving in the direction of two way. And I think we see this more recently in examples like Sweden and Korea, where the government plays a more hands-off approach with cultural diplomacy, turning over the keys to the general public in each of their polities and constituencies to really take the lead. And then the nation tries to prop up and promote the best of those things, but not engineer them um, in as, as um, uh, um, micromanaging a way. But of course, there are examples to the contrary today, um, one of them being the Confucius Institute, which has been in the news again um, since the United States has labeled Confucius Institutes a foreign mission. Um, so, uh, and, and always questions surrounding the Confucius Institute of its intentions 
um, because it presents itself as a language and cultural center. But uh, of course, um, there's um, long been a suspicion that it's really interested in having a one-way conversation with people and not really interested in having a two-way conversation. Um, the last thing that I'll say before I run out of time here is um, the, uh, that, that, that there is this whole other world of cultural diplomacy happening in the non-state arena. Um, and just three that I'll list really briefly here, one of them being entertainment and an example being um, Turkish dramas um, and you know, going beyond what we normally think of as, um, as private-led uh, entertainment um, promotion of a brand like with Bollywood or Hollywood. Um, and then there's food and gastro diplomacy, which has really caught on in the last 10, 15 years. And then also diasporic um, cultural diplomacy, where states work in collaboration with their diasporas that have um, that are living abroad to try to accomplish some sort of gain, but also let the diasporas lead so as to not make it seem like they're too cozy with each other. So um, I'll leave it there. And um, thank you for uh, for listening. And I'll look forward to your questions. Awesome, Rob. Um, we're going to proceed directly to Haley Pottle, and let me int first introduce um, Haley Pottle. Um, so Haley is an international education and development professional pursuing a career in strategic international education, global communications, and leadership development in cross-cultural competency. She has expertise and experience in program development for, for program development for higher education, nonprofit and governmental organizations, including as program coordinator for the US Department of State's Tech Girls Initiative, which she'll be talking about, and project development manager for Hopes for Women in Education in Amman, Jordan, education consultant for the Office of Multicultural Affairs at the University of Richmond, program coordinator for the Office of Scholars and Fellowships at the University of Richmond, and Administrative Coordinator for Virginia Commonwealth University's Emerging Leaders Program. She holds a bachelor's degree in mass communications from Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, Haley, take it away. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are in the world today. Um, thank you so much, Robert, for the great presentation. I don't have a fancy mic, so please let me know if you can't hear me or anything, and I'll just turn it up on my laptop. Um, but yes, as Paul said, I've um, lived and worked across the Middle East, North Africa, as well as the Gulf area, the MENA region. Um, I've studied some Arabic at uh, Middlebury's uh, language, uh, language schools, and I still do some consulting with higher education. But today I'll be talking about Tech Girls. So let me see if I can just share my screen. And I will be also um, recording um, myself to make sure I'm on time as well. So let's see if we can get it to um, slideshow. Two. Great. So um, in terms of today, we'll be talking about Tech Girls, which is an initiative of the US Department of State. You've heard that a few times today. Um, it's from the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs and is administered by a nonprofit Legacy International, and it's in a partnership with Virginia Tech. The goal and objective for this program is truly citizen diplomacy. It's connecting and supporting the next generation of women leaders in STEM. We work with um, young high school students, 15 to 17 years old from the United States, seven countries in the Middle East, North Africa, as well as Central Asia, which was just expanded in 2019. Uh, what former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton uh, was able to spearhead this program in 2012 right after the Arab Spring and recognizing the deep need to enhance the relationships between the MENA region as well as the United States. And most recently, we've been working more um, on the Central Asia region, um, including Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. The Tech Women program was actually the first initiative from Secretary Clinton um, in 2011, uh, the previous year. Um, and that works with young professional women from 24 to mid 30s. Um, but really, there is a deep need recognized to work with high school students, as I'm sure many of you all know, um, in the MENA region for high schoolers, um, they take kind of a really intense, almost accelerated version of an SAT, which determines what they can even study um, in university. So getting that interest peaked in high school is really important to be able to even have the opportunity to study STEM later. 
So I talked a little bit about where the girls are from, but we work with 10 U.S. girls each year from across um, the United States. So we've had more than 20 states represented um, from U.S. girls, uh, 15 to 17 again. Um, variety of backgrounds um, and contexts that they come from, which is really exciting. So it really provides the international students a full scope of what an American looks like. And a lot of those barriers and myths about what is an American, what does America look like, is really transformed. In the MENA region, we work with Algeria, Egypt, um, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, Palestinian territories, and Tunisia. We used to work with Libya and Yemen as well, but we need a U.S. Embassy presence in order to continue that. Um, and I already mentioned the four stands that we work with in Central Asia. The program itself is a structured as a three-week immersive experience in the United States. Clearly with COVID, that didn't happen in person this year, but I'll be talking a little bit about what we did um, virtually in the midst of the pandemic. Um, the program itself is um, much more sustainable and longstanding than just the three weeks. It's followed by months of coaching as they implement home-based uh, projects in their countries to benefit their communities. There's a variety of STEM training, leadership development, cross-cultural immersion that these participants go through so that they are equipped to really um, support their countries when they go back home. They do everything from coding and cybersecurity courses in their um, schools at home or their education centers. They do leadership seminars. They work directly with their schools and then their um, communities. And what's really exciting about this program is we don't just take students from their capital city. So for example, with Jordan, we don't just recruit, recruit girls from Amman. We recruit girls from Aqaba, from Jarash, from Urbit, from lots of rural areas for each of the countries. Um, and there's a lot of diplomacy that also goes even just within the countries that the Department of State facilitates. There's a lot of kind of myths and barriers even within Morocco um, or within Algeria where a lot of kind of these stereotypes are um, broken down, which is really exciting. In addition, we have a strong partnership with the Tech Women program. So after they go through the program, they're set up with mentors from their US-based job shadows and partners, as well as the Tech Women in their home countries to be able to really support them in their STEM journey. And that linkage with the US, with professors from Virginia Tech who are teaching university level courses, from our partners like NASA, Amazon, AT&T, NPR, and other organizations. Uh, these relationships have withstood the eight years of the program which is really exciting. Um, so I've talked a little bit about what the tech girls do, but to kind of provide you some details, they do a lot of things I would never really be able to study. So I'm glad to just facilitate the program and they take on the cybersecurity and the Java and Python and everything. And they enjoy it a lot. So they have university level um, courses that they take on with some of them being 15 years old, which is extraordinary. Um, we take them to lots of research labs where they can actually see the variety of careers out there. It's not just coding or it's not just becoming a doctor. There's a variety of opportunities that they can pursue. Um, myself and my team facilitate what we call leadership clinics, which are a lot of kind of soft skills training and public speaking, as well as collaboration, working in teams, things of that nature. Uh, we do job shadowing with major tech companies. So we've had uh, partners like Amazon, AT&T, NPR, as well as some more local organizations in DC in Southwest Virginia, like Block One, Qualtrics, Echo & Co, to really provide the girls again with those um, relationships that will really benefit them in the future. One of my favorite aspects of the program is the host family visits. So we work with um, families that go through a very, of course, in, a very intense screening process, and they actually spend a weekend of the program with an American family. I think that's probably one of the strongest aspects of that cultural diplomacy that we execute is not even actually with us. It's with the families that we recruit who really provide that um, I spy of what it's like to be an American family in the US. Um, and that's typically the girl's favorite part of the program. Even more than just taking coding, it's really getting to get to know a family on a personal level. Um, we also do cultural events. We take them everywhere from a um, basketball game in, you know, Washington, D.C. We have them put on cultural presentations where they wear traditional dress, food, as um, my last presenter was talking about with, you know, the variety of diplomacy that's out there. It's really exciting to delve into, as well as service projects serving the impoverished communities in D.C. It's really jam-packed, as you can tell. Um, so we also work in going to Capitol Hill. They meet with senators and learn about how U.S. government is structured because obviously that's very different than a lot of their um, their home country's government structures. Having that, I find what does democracy even look like and how does it function? 
um, as well as a visit to the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, where we work with um, STEM um, engineers who are females at NASA, and they get to talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, do a panel, do an exclusive tour. It's very fun. So typically the program runs in the summer, July to August. It's in Washington, D.C., as well as at Virginia Tech, which is Southwest Virginia. Um, and that's, again, non-COVID times. Um, some of the things that have really just developed from the program over the eight years are just these incredible accomplishments from these young women. There's everything from STEM competitions to addressing major community issues um, and completing different trainings, competing in educational opportunities in universities. We have tech roles, international and US based who have gone on to study at Harvard, MIT, Stanford, um, Yale, all types of universities um, and all types of programs as well. It's not just STEM, they also go into business and other areas of study as well. Um, and a lot of that is due to the good relationships they built in the US. And also, it's really a family affair, convincing a parent um, in another country to let their minor child come to the United States is not always an easy thing. And so typically, this program also boosts the, the mindset of the United States, as well as the different relationships for study abroad opportunities, as well as work in the future. Um, these are a couple of pictures of some of the amazing tech girls out there. They really do make a difference. We just actually had a um, tech girl Shahad from last year, 2019. She's only 16 years old and she was actually approved. She designed a ventilator due to helping um, patients um, dealing with COVID-19 that was approved for use in Egypt. So she's actually working directly with hospitals in Egypt as a 16 year old to enact her ventilators. Um, we have um, Hayot in Uzbekistan who um, through her STEM training in cybersecurity, she's doing peer education led um, trainings uh, sponsored by her U.S. Embassy across Uzbekistan, you know, fully funded to provide um, youth um, the information they know to keep their personal information safe. So there's a variety of girls out there doing incredible things and lots of collaborative work. Uh, we also have girls from the U.S. who are collaborating with girls in other countries to develop programming in English, as obviously that's not their native language. Um, so it's really exciting to see that cross-cultural effusion. Haley, you've got about, three, about three, minutes. three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. Yep. Great. Glad we're on the same page. Um, so obviously all these great things I talked about were all in person. So what did we do this year for 2020 when that wasn't possible? So when COVID-19 suspended all the programs, um, my team at Legacy International realized we needed to kick into high gear and figure out how we could try to translate the experience virtually for them as best as we could um, at minimal cost because again, we knew we had a tight budget. This program is fully funded for the girls, so we didn't want to put any kind of cost on them. And so we took our different curriculums and we created a virtual experience where we have 62 tech girls, 10 from the US, 28 from the Meta region, and 24 from Central Asia. So that's covering 12 different countries. Um, so we did kind of a hybrid feel where we worked asynchronously as well as synchronously. We used a learning management system called Talent LMS that's really dynamic as it provides opportunities to insert discussion boards, assignments, um, videos, um, Zoom links. Um, it's really functional in a variety of capacities and it's pretty user friendly, which we definitely needed working with high schoolers. Um, so about 50% of the program was asynchronous and the other half was very dynamic Zoom sessions and to kind of really break it down so they got a sense of community we split them up into different pathways, as we called them, which were individualized curriculum. So in week one, they were all together doing cross-cultural um, activities and dialogues, and then we split them up so they could really get to know each other from different countries, and then brought them back together. Throughout this whole program, we also made sure they worked on projects so they could walk away with the program, as virtual exchange is really successful once you have those um, projects in involved. So to kind of wrap up with my last minute, in terms of how we can get involved, I think that it really is important to invest in that professional and personal development for youth. They really are the future today as well as tomorrow. Um, they're gonna be the ones shaping policy. They're gonna be the ones with soft power. And I think that more than ever, we've seen the divide in our own nation as well as globally. And it's really, really important to be able to empower youth to see that we are all global citizens and we all have the responsibility um, there. Also the power of the network. Um, if any of you all are interested in the future, hopefully we'll be doing an in-person program in 2021. That's still kind of to be determined, but 
we're always looking for more partners and job shadows and um, support for the Tech Girls program um, to support that citizen diplomacy. Um, so those are all opportunities to engage. And of course, you can connect with me on LinkedIn or email me as well. So these are just kind of some of my ideas that I think virtual exchange is the future of citizen diplomacy in a lot of ways, not just post pandemic because of the way that COVID is run um, in the last year, but also just because of the use we have with technology. And it's not limited to in-person experiences. And really, it's all about relationships. As was mentioned in the last presentation, if there's a personal relationship, that's really where diplomacy is fostered. It's not just a, you know, a broad program. It's really the connections you make at the end of the day. So yeah, I'll just end with this quote from Iftihal that you guys can read from Algeria. And thank you all so much for your time. I hope you found it helpful and informative. Awesome, Haley. Thanks to both of you for keeping to the, uh, the 12 minutes. I know it's not a lot of time, but you guys got um, a lot of information out. Um, so uh, this is um, to kind of organize uh, the 25 minutes that we have um, to do the, um, to discuss this and ask questions. I'd like for each of you who want to ask questions or make comments to please write your, just note that in the chat um, so that we'll basically go in order. Um, and while you're doing that, um, uh, I will ask a question um, while we're waiting for some of you to, to, um, to indicate whether you want to ask questions. Um, first, let me hold on a second and reset and restart this so I'll make sure that we're sticking to 25 minutes. Um, so, um, Haley, I had a question for you, um, which is, um, I'm wondering if there is some sort, when you're screening the applicants, whether or not you, you can, um, uh, and do take a look at, or if you know, if you're taking a look at income, um, or for instance, parents' education, because, um, my concern, I guess, an ongoing concern I have with uh, uh, citizen diplomacy is that uh, middle and income kids are much better equipped and positioned to take advantage of these things. And so the concern in the long term is that we end up reinforcing inequalities, making the inequalities worse um, through programs uh, like this, rather than um, creating opportunities for a much broader spectrum of people across the world. So I'm wondering if you know anything about the the screening process and whether that takes into account income and parents' education or things, things like that. Yeah. Thank you so much for your question. Yeah, I definitely didn't have time to delve into the recruitment process, but it's basically like them applying for college. It's very intensive. So I tell them, if you can get through Tech Girls, you can get through a college application, no problem. Um, they do a variety of essays. They have to submit transcripts. They have to submit um, their parents' occupation. So we don't specifically ask for their highest level of education as with different countries that's kind of hard to translate and assess as well but we do ask for their occupation uh, we ask obviously for where they reside and typically a lot of times depending on where they are located in the country that's an indicator also of level of income as we have specialists on our panels for screening who understand kind of the, the context in each of these smaller cities and towns as well um, so my team with legacy does the first initial screening where we do look at um, a variety of factors of location, parents' occupation, their grades. Uh, we don't require them to have an extensive STEM experience. It's obviously encouraged, but we do base a lot of it on English language um, fluency as that's obviously necessary for the program. So they have to demonstrate that in their essays um, as well as um, you know the transcripts that they provided to show that they are studying English. Um, as well as we get recommendations from you know different teachers as well. That's optional now because we recognize that was also a barrier for some students depending on the school that they were at. Um, and we now require that it's a more geographically um, kind of holistic screening. And we work closely with the embassies where they actually interview the girls typically in person. This year they did it virtually. And so they are, they are able as you know experts in country to be able to really assess which girls maybe on paper don't look like the best applicant, but they really have the commitment and the interest um, to be able to be in the program. So it's a really exciting thing where we have girls who have developed robots and then we have girls who just, you know, want to be an astronomer in the future, but have had no experience to that. So we try to be as holistic as we can in terms of, you know, making sure we get a full kind of well-rounded group every year. Um, so th thanks, Haley. So we have uh, a question from Maschino. Um, 
I must, you know, I don't know what your first name is. I don't know if that's that is your first name. If you could introduce yourself and just um, say your question. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks again, Haley. Uh, my first name is Mark. Um, I I'm curious uh, about one of the challenges you, you must have, given the fact that this program requires uh, fluent English, how do you avoid uh, having just girls come from elite backgrounds where they have opportunities that perhaps poor girls in rural areas uh, do not have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for your question. Um, one of the things we do, which ends up being a lot of work on our end, but really helps to make sure that we're not just letting the elites in, is that we interview many girls. For, for instance, for the Mena region, we have about you know four girls that we take and we require them to not all be from the same city. And so we will interview at least um, triple the amount. So we're gonna interview at least 12 to 16 girls to make sure that um, we see on paper in terms of you know, their experience and typically also their school really reveals a lot, um, whether they're at a private school, whether they're at a governmental school. For example, in Jordan, that, that indicates a level of wealth and of income and of elite if their parents can afford to send them to that school. So we also have a requirement that we can't have girls all from the same school. For instance, again, I keep using Amon, but it's always in my head. Jubilee is a school that a lot of girls will come from, but it's a, it's a more renowned school where we wanna make sure there are different locations of it where they do have one in Urbid and also in Amon. So we're not gonna take two girls from there. We have a ton of factors as you can tell to look through. So um, we really do rely on the embassies to kind of help us identify those more subtle nuances that are really revealing. And their interviews as well, if they're not, perfect in English, but they're just about there. We have definitely taken girls in the program who exemplify a lot of, you know, potential, even if, of course, their English isn't perfect. Um, and the program really helps them get better at it as well. Um, we have also considered, we are looking actually to expand to Sub-Saharan Africa. It's all based on the grant um, from the Department of State. So we expanded in 2019 to Central Asia. We're considering doing that beginning in 2022. That's when the next grant cycle will allow for that. Um, expansion um, because the tech women program is active in sub-Saharan Africa and so we really want that kind of ongoing mentorship and support because if you're at high school and going back and have no support from like a woman mentor that makes it a lot harder um, in the long term so we want to make sure that we're looking at we've also looked at South um, Southeast Asia as well looking at India and Pakistan and some other areas but sub-Saharan Africa is the next area that we're looking to hopefully expand in the next couple of years so thank you for that. Um, Haley, just before we get to Syed, who's got a question about the age of the girls, um, uh, a quick follow-up to that. Um, does the State Department um, set the requirements in terms of search criteria, um, or do you guys set that? In turn, so you noted that you're looking for diversity across uh, geographic diversity. Is that something the State Department sets, or, or you guys have discretion in determining the criteria for admission? Yeah, so it's, it's very collaborative. We look at the trends every year and who we end up actually recruiting and we have a variety of kind of evaluation and measurement sessions. Um, typically the Department of State will kind of adapt those requirements a little bit every year, but that's also based on our recommendations. Um, the embassies also put in a ton of input where for instance, um, US Embassy in um, Jerusalem, before we were mainly taking girls from um, Palestinian territories, including Ramallah, um, Bethlehem, uh, Nablus, like heavily um, populated alumni areas, because really where we have a lot of Tech Girls alumni, we tend to get more applicants because they go to the same schools, their families know each other, the communities are small. And for instance, the US Embassy really had a high criteria just request that we start actually making sure that we're admitting at least one girl from Jerusalem, if possible. You know, if they're making the you know, eligibility and criteria, we'd like to make sure they at least get interviewed. Um, because a lot of times, very competitive applicants in Palestinian territories will come from the same areas where we have alumni. This is kind of getting into the weeds, but a lot of times the embassies will also put in specific requests where they're wanting to do some more, yeah, kind of support and relationship in certain areas of each country where there isn't a lot of US embassy presence or there isn't a lot of development where they want it to be. Um, so that's um, kind of an answer to that, hopefully. Great. Um, Syed, um, and w if, you, if you want to ask your question, um, and I also want to encourage all of you, if you have questions for Rob, um, given the kind of broader context of uh, citizen diplomacy, uh, feel free to post your questions to the, um, to the chat. 
um, and you'll get a chance to, to, to ask them. Um, Syed. I particularly ask that question, the reason being is uh, in Bangladesh, uh, there are some private universities uh, who are actually encouraging these uh, robotics and uh, animation programs and state things. And also there is a very small private, uh, you can say, personally funded institution called Tech Academy, uh, where they teach children from, uh, from eight years to 14 or 15. And it's like my son and daughter both are into it and they're really into animation. And they also teach robots. So I was wondering like, what age group do you prefer and have you, or do you intend to explore in this area in Bangladesh or not? Great, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for your question. The current requirements for the program is that they were 15 to 17 years old. A lot of that is because these girls are, you know, phenomenal and extraordinary. And once they hit 18 years old, um, and even sometimes 17, they're off to university. And um, so that makes it challenging in terms of visa processing and passport issuing and all of that for them to be able to come to the States and not have to worry about the combination since they, if they're at university and then having to in, implement a really intense community-based project, a lot of times that's just not feasible. And really we're trying to make sure that we engage in that, um, STEM development before they have to take their major exams at the end of their high school career so that they have more experience in order to be more informed in those, um, those exams that they're going to have to take. Um, we, have considered, we have considered expanding a little bit more on the age range, higher or lower, and there are always exceptions to the rule where, for instance, this year, since we have a fair amount of 17-year-olds and since they weren't able to come to the U.S. this year, our plan is hopefully pending, you know, travel restrictions easing and the pandemic easing as well would be to bring the 2020 girls to the US next summer, as well as a smaller cohort from 2021. Um, and so many of those girls will be 18 years old by the time they'd actually come to the US, which is technically outside of the grant parameters. However, because of, you know, these forever extenuating circumstances, we're making, we're making do with that as well. Um, so currently 15 to 17, we've kind of talked about maybe adding 14 um, or expanding it to 18, but currently that's where we, where we stand. Question, other questions uh, that you guys have for Rob or Haley? I have a question for Rob, but I want to hear from you guys first. I have a question for Rob, if that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Thank you so much again, Rob, for your presentation. I loved, yeah, you sharing um, all of the stories that really makes it come to life. Um, I would love to hear from you in terms of, you've talked more recently about what um, citizen diplomacy, cultural diplomacy looks like. I just have any thought, just wondering if you have any thoughts in terms of um, with COVID-19 and translating that virtually, if you have any additional thoughts on how you've seen countries already start to facilitate that or where you expect them to do in order to kind of maintain that relationship building. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, and I'll, um, you know, just bounce the credit back to you as well for a great presentation. It, you know, I, it's, um, it's, it's an interesting question you raise about how to adapt to, to, um, to the pandemic. And, you know, I, 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 I mean, obviously, it's really affected the way that people do their programming. And I think you're a classic example of that. Um, but um, it's, um, I don't know. In, in my look at it, I have not quite been able to discern a trend of where this is going, and and I and I, I think this is reflective of where a lot of our hopes lie right now. Is that this is not going to be the new normal, and that we can get back to putting people in the same room again at some point, and um, and that uh, you know in the meantime we have tools to kind of over. Uh, like just kind of work around um, the limitations that we've got right now. So, um, so I don't know, I'm not seeing yet any kind of firm commitments uh, one way or the other, whether it's from um, the non-state or state side, uh, you know, that, that, are, that are really, you know, in full adaptation mode to, to COVID. It's, it's more, I think, of, of, of temporary adjustment. Um, so um, so that's, that's, that's where I would probably place my bet. Awesome, other, thank you. other questions for Rob or Haley? If we have time, I'd 
like to ask one of both, uh, Paul, if that's okay. Yes. Um, so uh, I'm interested in what both of you um, are, are experiencing in terms of um, evaluating uh, these kinds of relationship building programs. I mean, you know, there's a lot of different creative avenues for that. And uh, I've been trying to wrap my, wrap my head around it my arms at times, <laughs> but not these days because of the pandemic. And uh, would would like to, you know, ask that question and also encourage folks who are also is interested in this to that perhaps we could get together at some future time um, virtually and, and discuss. Um, and I'm sorry, uh, uh, Debbie, was that a question or, or just a, a, a comment? Yeah, just about eva evaluating these kinds of relationship building projects. Yeah, I can um, answer part of that and I'm sure Rob can add to it as well. Um, it's funny you mentioned that because I think, yeah, once the pandemic hit and, you know, we were very busy preparing for the virtual exchanges, we were also trying to think of productive ways that we could use our time so we weren't just sitting at home. Um, so Tech Girls is actually going through, it was selected to go through a really major evaluation um, process to really look at the sustainability and the strength of the relationship. So um, some of the ways and kind of strategies to not get too technical in doing it is looking at the longevity of the relationship. So who were our, you know, job shadow hosts and our partners and our tech partners and the tech girls participants? Um, are they still in touch with each other? Do they have relevant contact information? Um, you know, what have these girls done to after the program? So have they pursued STEM? Have they gone on to further studies? Um, we're kind of doing a really deep dive over the next year on all of these aspects. Um, the Excel spreadsheets are massive um, and slightly frightening, but it's um, really exciting to see that um, it really is about to measure the relationships. It, a lot of it is unfortunately the kind of very draining qualitative interviews and just hopping on a phone call with people, sending out emails and asking who they stayed in touch with and how and kind of what the extent to that relationship has been. So far, and even just the last few months, we've seen some of the strongest relationships, for me, unsurprisingly, come out of the host families. Many of these girls still will email or literally write letters to their homestay families, and they've still stayed in touch for over five, six, eight years. Um, so I think that is really kind of getting revealed in this. Um, and also sometimes the job shadow partners, that's a little bit harder to calculate because there's typically a high turnover rate in some of those corporate environments where they stay in touch with the person who is their job shadow host, but they no longer work for that company. So that's kind of an obstacle we're trying to overcome as well. But a lot of it's that interview, lots of surveys, and really just reconnecting with the Tech Girls alumni to say, who are you still in touch with? And who are your recommenders? And that kind of thing. Um, Anna Popkova um, has a question. I'm wondering if, Anna, would you like to ask your question? Absolutely, yes, thank you. I, though I thought uh, maybe Robert wanted to answer the previous one too. Oh, did I miss a question? Maybe, because that question about the evaluation. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I, I'm yeah. sorry. I can, once he answers, then I can jump in and ask him. Yes, my... good, thanks Anna for mm -hmm. noting that. Yeah, I, I'm not gonna add too much, um, but I'll just say that, um, you know, just jumping off of something that I think Haley said before about tracking these participants over time, and um, that really, I think, is um, is just uh, precious data to gather from participants in these programs. Is not just knowing what they've done, or you know, like in terms of immediate term activities and experiences, but being able to come back to them again down the line and um, and and determine, you know, was that program somehow instrumental in charting a course for them, um, shaping a way of thinking, uh, a perspective um, that without which, you know, without the program, it just would not have come about. And, and to, you know, to me, that's, um, that's both the most precious data, but the hardest to obtain for many obvious reasons. But, you know, um, a lot of it having to do with just um, uh, sustaining the connection with participants so that you can come back to them later and, uh, and, and draw out from them you know, the lasting impact of their experience. So that, that I think, um, has been raised in a number of forms, not just by me, but, um, you know, as, as some of the, the clearest evidence that the long-term relationship building effort is working. 
And if I can actually just add to that really quick, um, thank you, just you sparked an idea for me as well, Rob. Um, so one of the things we do as well, we do an annual survey from the alumni. So every time we get new alumni, they're technically considered alumni after the program ends in August. So we do a huge annual survey that we send out to all of our alumni all the way back from 2012 in October. And we give it about a month to get results from that. And we have everything from WhatsApp groups and Facebook, as well as our weekly alumni newsletter. So typically we get, we get over um, between over 60, 70% of the alumni to actually respond to it consistently every year. So we get everything from where they are at school, the relationships they've maintained. That's something we try to do on an annual basis. That way we're not totally overwhelmed when we have a, a massive, longer, expansive evaluation to do. But Rob is totally right. It is about engaging them. We do some kind of alumni Zoom calls every few months before COVID started just to reconnect with girls. So it's not like we're coming out of the woodwork and saying, we haven't talked to you in three years. What are you up to now? Um, so it's much more like a, hey, how's it going? And a lot of times we encourage them to submit what they're up to to us, you know? Um, so in a newsletter, I'll say, hey, what are you up to now? Just send me a note. And then we'll get these amazing stories from girls and we highlight them on our website actually with Tech Girls. We have what's called impact stories where twice a month I highlight, you know, the extraordinary successes for the girls. And of course they like to be published online and share it to their friends and family and on their Facebook. So that's actually a way that we get a lot of their kind of ongoing um, connections um, is through that avenue as well. And I can share that link in the, the chat. But yeah, I just thought of that as well. Okay, so Anna's next and then uh, Lior has a question um, and then we'll have to move to the, um, to the next part of our meeting. Anna. Thank you. And thank you both presenters, wonderful presentations. And I love how they uh, kind of aligned uh, in different ways and had these points of points of connections. Um, Robert, my, my and, and in general, I'm, I'm a fan of war, Robert's work. His book actually, Agency Change, has been a major inspiration for me, theoretically, for my work on um, non-state uh, public diplomacy. So um, it's exciting to hear about your what you're working on right now. And um, you, in your presentation, you raised that question of, well, so the case of Samantha Smith, why did it not get as much traction and coverage in the U.S.? And and uh, um, to me, you know, it's this question raises the, this larger question of reciprocity in citizen diplomacy and authenticity and how important it is. And so um, my question is, and I realize that you're probably in the process of working on it and figuring it out, but when, since we're all here together, can you share some insights? So why? Why is it the case? And also what does it tell us about reciprocity in citizen diplomacy? Yeah, well, th thank you. And you're absolutely right. I'm still trying to get to the bottom of where all the, you know, um, you know, the impact was. And, um, and to me, that's really fascinating. I feel like that has something to offer to the broader conversation of monitoring and evaluation, the success of cultural diplomacy over time. We're very much focused on the meta level right now. Um, but um, I'm really interested in, in the humanistic side of the cultural diplomacy experience and um, and what it is about in in, in particular these um, highly highly visible ones. Um, it may not seem like this anymore in the United States, but back in the summer of 1983, Samantha Smith was the most famous 11 year old girl in the world. And um, and I think what happened in the Soviet Union was um, a uh, an, an an intensive effort to really enshrine her within um the, you know as as a, as a legacy figure um for goodwill um across these um these these tense um times and um you know and it came in many different forms um but you know for future generations to remember her i think it had a lot to do with the fact that her story was introduced into um, schools, um, that there were lots of um, monuments that, that bear her name. Um, they named a mountain after her, a constellation, a gemstone, a, um, uh, yeah, th th uh, they had a, a postage stamp. Um, they introduced her story into link English language textbooks. You know, so, so there was a lot um, that really perpetuated the inspiration of Samantha's story. And then particularly after she died unexpectedly, um, you see the outpouring, um, you know, coming, you know, pretty um, emotionally out of the Soviet Union um, 
and, and that memory has lived on. So it's, it's really about, um, I think, the way that her history has been preserved in the Soviet Union and, um, and, and in former Soviet states, um, and not so much here, where it was more of kind of a passing news story, um, just never really reached um, its height um, after the big trip in 83, um, even though her celebrity didn't die per se. So, um, so hopefully I'll have something more you know, rigorous and, uh, and, and structured, you know, to say about that. But um, at the moment, that's really what I'm, what I'm wrestling with is just two very different historical memories. Uh, so your, your next, and then we, we're going to have to stop it because we were, uh, we need to move on. Um, and if anybody has, does have other questions, I would encourage both, um, our presenters, if you could, uh, if you haven't already, um, uh, post your, uh, your email address um, in case people want to follow up with questions. Lior. Yeah, so thank you very much. It's very interesting. And I have a question for both. Uh, so first of all, what was very interesting, and I was working on Norman Cousins that was also involving some cultural diplomacy between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And I, was, I wanted to ask you about the other side of the spectrum about opposition to this kind of cultural diplomacy. And we saw that in the U.S.-Soviet Union that sometimes it can be considered as a threat for the other side, that maybe they're trying to play like, cultural imperialism. We saw that also between Israel and Egypt, even after the peace agreement, there was still a lot of fear about it and a lot of uh, like trying to do cultural boycott. Uh, so I want to ask you if you're dealing also with the other side of the opposition and how it can be overcome. And Haley, I have some maybe sensitive questions, but I wanted to ask you if you had some challenges in the program during this current administration, during the Trump administration, if you felt that there was some different policy or different approach uh, toward this program and also the travel ban at the beginning. Thanks. Um, I'll quickly answer that um, if the threat was palpable anywhere, it was really within the United States about what Samantha Smith was doing because this totally flew in the face of the narrative that had been generated by the American government about the Soviet Union, you know, um, you know, so nicely, um, you know, illustrated by the evil empire speech just months before her visit. And, um, and so the Reagan administration's stance about Samantha Smith was totally hands off. I was shocked to find that the, the, the person who ran the Russian desk, um, a gentleman um, named Tom Simons, um, just happened, you know, to, um, uh, to, to chat with the family briefly before their trip, you know, very little involvement. Um, that was not only the way they wanted it, but also um, really just uh, towing the line from the administration that they just didn't want to play into what they thought was a Soviet um, action to um, just kind of co-opt an American girl into their, their, their own narrative. So that's really where the threat was felt. And, and I think that feeds into um, the, one of the reasons why her memory in the United States is uh, relatively weak by comparison. It's, it's just that there was a strong note of, um, of distrust that, that was an undercurrent for, for all of this. All right. Um, I want to thank again uh, both of our presenters. Oh, Haley, Do you mind I'm if sorry. I answer your second question really I'm, quick? I'm sorry. I keep cutting you guys no off. <laughs> it's a sensitive question, so we can skip it, but I want to honor his question. Um, so I joined the Tech Girls team at the beginning of 2017, right after Trump was elected. So I was hired, I think it's January, February of 2017. And um, I remember getting hired and everyone kind of saying, we'll see how it goes. Um, and so that was kind of how I joined, uh, which was an interesting way to onboard to a new position. Um, shockingly, I think this program has had such support um, over the years that it was able to kind of maintain despite the challenges over the last few years um, to shockingly get expanded in 2019. I think that was the biggest surprise we didn't expect. We, we expected a funding cut or potential suspension, but we got the opposite. I think that, um, you know, there's been such a need in the meta region, but I think ironically with this new administration, we're recognizing we need to make ties with Central Asia. One, because they're in between Russia and China, and that's an interesting area for the U.S. to want to have good relationships with. So I think that's, in a way, a result of the Trump administration that served us. Um, ironic.
um, for other areas where I think citizen diplomacy has been served very well. However, I think the, the reasons to expand in that area were maybe had some ulterior motives, but it's worked out well so far. Um, with the travel ban, that was definitely pretty nerve wracking to get the visas. And that was something we had to work very closely with the embassies on. Um, but yeah, thankfully, I think again, the program is such a credibility and renowned that we've been able to overcome a lot of barriers, but I know in general, ECA has not had an easy few years. So we'll put it that way. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, now I can, um, uh, transition us. Thank you. Thank you both, um, for your presentations. Um, and, uh, so I want to, uh, move into the announcements section of our meeting. So this is the opportunity for any of you um, in one minute or less uh, to uh, announce any programs, projects, um, uh, uh, needs that you have as an organization or as an individual. Um, uh, so any, any, other, any other things that you wanna bring up, uh, publications, et cetera. Uh, you can, of course, I wanna encourage you to put the details in the chat because not only will this group then get it, but also we will share it with the wider group on our email list. Um, and I'll start things off by sharing with you all um, two announcements um, or two, two things that may be of interest to you. Um, in, uh, and I just posted them in the chat. One is uh, from is my own organization, Learning Life. Um, we have a family diplomacy initiative, which I think I've mentioned before. Um, which connects families worldwide on Facebook to share and learn together with an eye to nurturing a more caring world. Um, it is on Facebook, um, so it's free to, for anybody to join. We're currently doing a food culture project where families across the world are exchanging photos on questions like, uh, what does breakfast look like in your family? What's a food um, uh, trend in your country, et cetera, and so forth. So feel free to join, the link is there. The other thing I wanna mention is the Virtual Exchange Coalition. For those of you who don't know about it, um, it is a network of professionals worldwide who share, learn, and collaborate to advance the field of international virtual exchange uh, for purposes of education, diplomacy, development, and peace. So um, the VEC likewise meets every two months via Zoom, um, and you can find out about their meetings and get notices of other things going on, basically join the community through the Facebook group, which is likewise linked here. Um, other people with announcements or things that they wanna share, uh, collaboration proposals, et cetera. I am sure there, is, there, is, there are things going on in the world of citizen diplomacy worldwide. Uh, please share. I'll, I'll share something, uh, Paul, if that's possible. Absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. Um, first time being here. My name's Chris Wickfield, and I'm coming from you from sunny Britain, uh, which is currently being battered by Storm Francis. So, uh, although it might look bright outside, I can assure you the 80 mile an hour winds are making sure it's not. Um, so, uh, I'm not sure if some of you saw my bio I post in the chat, but for those that aren't aware, uh, I'm a, the research officer at an organization called Democracy Volunteers, which is Europe's largest domestic observer group. So what we do is essentially observe elections in the UK and around the world, um, ensuring that they're run properly, um, essentially. And we have a symposium on electoral integrity coming up on the 1st of September. Um, so for those that are interested in that sort of thing, I encourage you to at least have a look and potentially attend. Um, if you're interested, maybe an example of our work, we recently published a report on how to conduct elections during COVID, um, which is free online on our website, and I can post that, uh, I'll, I'll link to our website in the chat afterwards. Um, but yeah, go on there, have a look. We've got a number of events coming up. Uh, another one is a talk by Leslie Abdella, MBE. Uh, she's a political activist, having worked in over several countries, uh, particularly women's empowerment in politics and the like. Um, so we've got an evening with her coming up as well, which will be really interesting. So I encourage you all to have a look at that and potentially join us for those events. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Chris. Please do share that information via the chat so that people can join. Other, other announcements? Um, Holly, Holly just announced something. Do you want to talk more about this here?
Hi, everyone. I just wanted to point out just a few of many intercultural resources. Um, that's really my background is intercultural relations. Um, my day job is at ECA, but um, I'm very active as adjunct faculty at George Washington University, et cetera. So I just wanted to share a few, again, of many, many resources, just because we often don't highlight, even though they're embedded, you know, the intercultural communication aspect and all those, those intercultural components that are so critical. So I just wanted to highlight those. Thanks so much, Paul. Great, awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, likewise, for uh, others of you who know of other um, resources um, and so websites, journals, mag uh, blogs, et cetera, and so forth on citizen diplomacy, whether it be cultural diplomacy or else, uh, please, do, please do share. Um, uh, Julia Pataki, you've got announcements. Hi, everyone. Um, this is also my first time joining here. I'm excited to be here. I'm a uh, rising professional uh, member of the PDC. Um, I currently work at the Goethe Institute, which is one of the organizations that Rob was talking about in his presentation. Um, and we have a couple of exciting projects that I just wanted to put out there in case anyone is interested. Um, one of them that's uh, going to be a big regional project in the fall is called Shaping the Past. And it's about how we remember the past and how the past is shaped through monuments and places of remembrance and non-remembrance. So um, I can put the link in the chat as well if anybody uh, would like to check that out. Awesome. Um, thank you, Julia. Uh, so, um, Tarwat, do you have uh, do you have something that you want to share? You've got a screenshot that you shared here, but anything you want to explain with regards to that? And it's, apologies if I missed. I think that uh, that uh, happened by mistake here. I was trying to get a flyer out uh, about it. Uh, there is a webinar this afternoon, sponsored by Baltimore Sister Cities, uh, takes place at seven o'clock about race, raising the curtain on race equity. Uh, so I was going to send the flyer, something else came out. So ignore what is there. I will try to post it in a minute. Okay, great. Um, and Haley, do you want to say anything about what you posted? Sure. Uh, so in addition to um, the current roles I have, I'm almost um, also, sorry, a leadership committee member for what's called the World Council on Intercultural and Global Competence. It's in partnership with UNESCO. It uh, connects researchers and practitioners um, to advance um, intercultural competence in a variety of ways. So it's research, praxis, a variety of things. Um, so it's not just academics, it's also um, people who are practicing it. So we're taking submissions for articles and papers for peer review publication um, from our website. We have experts on our team um, who um, review those. So if you're interested in getting published in something revolved around that topic, that's a great opportunity, as well as we're continuing to ask for volunteers in terms of our branding and our website. We've only been um, in existence for a little bit less than two years, so we're still you know, growing and developing, but you can check out the website as well as email me if you'd like to get involved. Um, and yeah, it's a really great opportunity. Great. Any other announcements? of citizen diplomacy related um, projects, programs, events, publications, et cetera? All right, if not, um, we will proceed um, to the last portion of our meeting. Um, and uh, feel free if, if something comes up and you, you forgot and you were going to um, share it, please do, uh, by all means, um, share it in the, the chat. Um, so in the last part of our meeting, uh, which wasn't represented in the, in the, uh, the, the meeting announcement, but I sent it out, um, uh, well, in, in the chat rather, but uh, I sent it out via email yesterday. Um, uh, so we are planning, as I mentioned earlier, to have um, two speakers, um, or at least one speaker, up to two speakers per uh, meeting. And as you know, so we're meeting every two months, and our next meeting is on um, the, I'll tell you in a moment, um, in fact, I'm going to send you um, this uh, in the chat, um, that we are... Uh, looking to 
um, find speakers not only for our October 28th meeting, which is our next, next meeting, but our subsequent meetings December 1st, February 3rd, and April 6th. So um, if you have ideas, um, now is a great time to share it. Um, uh, if, if you are interested in presenting on any aspect of citizen diplomacy. Uh, so, and mind you, this could be programs, projects, trends, theory, et cetera. If you do, for those, if there's nobody who has ideas um, uh, for upcoming meetings uh, um, or doesn't want to share them now, feel free to um, email me. I will include my email again here, um, uh, paullashleyatlearninglife.info. Um, you can email me with um, suggestions um, for presentations. Uh, so just keep in mind that it has to be citizen diplomacy related. Um, so it has to focus on people to people exchange across borders. Um, so any ideas? And also uh, we did have, I should note, um, uh, and we'll, um, I'll probably, I think, I think I sent, did I send everybody, uh, I can't remember, I sent everybody the results of our survey because that survey asked a question about um, the kinds of topics that everybody was interested in. And that has helped to some extent inform um, uh, the presentations that were, this, today's presentations and upcoming presentations. Um, I should note um, one other thing. Um, and um, and uh, so, People are posting stuff on the um, uh, the the chat, but um, uh, do you, Tharwat? Do you want to talk about this? Uh, is this a topic that you present? The, oh, is this is this is the Baltimore uh, Luxor group that you're? Well, that you're uh, actually, I, I'm not. Uh, this is a co uh, a committee of the group I uh, lead, uh, and they're doing this this afternoon. Ah, okay. Uh, so I just posted. Uh, you know, the actual webinar, if anyone interested, uh, it, it is really about uh, Baltimore uh, and race uh, equity in the city itself, and especially talking about uh, the uh, red uh, lining uh, extractor in, in the city. And, mm. and so it is a citizen to citizen uh, empowering uh, webinar. And also, there are top leaders going to be part of that, and uh, uh, a former uh, radio uh, will be conducting the actual uh, webinar. Great, good to know about it. Um, other, other, no. um, other ideas? Did you lose me? No, we we still got you. Uh, ben, you just posted something. Do you want to? Do you want to? Um, uh, talk about it. Sure. I, and this was like I had to get some info together. This isn't for uh, like for me to present, but uh, you know, related uh, to to an event. Um, I'm part of a co-working group called the Sh Chicago Literacy Alliance. It's the only co-working space I know in the United States focused on literacy. We have almost like 200 member organizations. So they do a yearly conference due to COVID. It's not in person, and they're just making it free. Um, so it's going to be on October 1st and 2nd, focused on um, using literacy to empower communities, poli politics, and democracy. The focus is, you know, on Chicago, because that's where we're located, but it, it definitely can be expanded to any community. There's going to be a lot, you know, all sorts of different community members, educators, presenting and interacting, breakout groups, um, should be interesting, especially virtual this year, but uh, definitely overlaps with a ton of what we're talking about especially going into a lot of the race issues related to, uh, related to literacy. Um, so it um, should be a really great event. And like I said, it's, it's free. I put the link, you can just register online. 
Um, and it, this is, like I said, it's a great, this is a great co-working space since everybody's really focused on literacy, everything from, you know, birth uh, through adulthood. adulthood. Mm -hmm. Great, Ben. Uh, thanks for posting that. Um, okay, so we are coming upon uh, the end of the meeting. I want to mention a couple of things. Um, one is that uh, we, um, if I encourage you to join, um, if you know of people who um, uh, should be involved in this organization and should be attending these meetings, um, please uh, email me or you can just simply put it in the chat, but you can also just email me um, with their names um, and uh, their, their titles, their organizations, and I'll be happy to add them or they can contact me directly. Um, so please let them know. As I mentioned um, earlier, um, you will get uh, a post sometime soon on the email list about um, the, um, uh, the, um, the Facebook group being formed and the LinkedIn group that will be formed as well. Um, the the uh, Facebook will, group will probably be the one that's more active, at least in, uh, as I, in my experience with, uh, with groups. Um, Facebook groups tend to be more animated than uh, LinkedIn groups, but nonetheless, they will both be opportunities um, to post citizen diplomacy related um, uh, events, programs, projects, um, calls for collaboration, uh, et cetera, and so forth. Um, and I think, uh, let me see if there's anything else um, to, to share with you. Um, there is, um, uh, we will have um, the next meeting on, as I mentioned, the 28th of October um, from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Uh, mind you, we're alternating, as you, know, as, as, um, as you might have noticed, uh, we're alternating between Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Um, those were times that um, uh, seemed to be favored um, in the... Um, in the survey that we uh, we had um, uh, that we sent out to the groups, so over 50 people responded, um, and uh, and so those see, seem to be the best times. I did note though that we are, um, and I've sent this um, in my most recent email, that we are um, U.S. heavy. Um, in other words, about 76% of currently of those on the email list are based in the United States. Um, so. As I mentioned, I'm going to do my best um, over the next several months, uh, as long as I'm chair, to try to um, lower the percentage of Americans. That's not to say remove people, but rather grow the number of people participating who come from other countries. Um, so for those of you who are joining us um, uh, in other places, um, please encourage your, um, your colleagues um, to join. Um, I, that likewise goes for uh, diversity in terms of the presenters. Uh, we'd like to make sure that we're, because this is a global network and a growing network, that um, the voices of those um, uh, doing citizen diplomacy work um, or researching citizen diplomacy in other countries are represented in these meetings. So by all means, if you have um, ideas uh, for presentations and you live um, abroad, live outside the United States, um, please um, let me know. Or if you know people who um, would be good candidates for presentation and should be in on this list who live in other countries outside the United States, I'd love to hear, um, hear from you. Um, okay, so... Um, I think there are a couple of other messages. Let me quickly re read here. Um, and yeah, Paul, it's really great to see all this um, in the chat. Um, and and we are saving the chat. So any, I I don't know if the private messages get saved, but certainly all the the ones for everyone. So we'll we'll try and follow up as best we can. But please do your own follow up. Yes, um, and thanks, Debbie, um, uh, for, for helping out with, uh, with these meetings. Um, I much appreciate uh, your, your help with this. So, um, okay, everybody, uh, we are at 1.30 precisely. Um, so uh, thanks for another great meeting, and we look forward to seeing you or many of you in October. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thanks again Thank to our speakers, Haley and Rob. Bye, Thank Paul. Bye, everybody.
Bye. Thank you.